Hi, I'm Sanna, this is Filtrit, and today we're translating the Kalevala. The Kalevala is an iconic text in Finland, and it has been absolutely instrumental in developing and codifying Finnish national identity for almost 200 years now. It is also very well known outside of Finland, and for many foreigners, maybe the first contact point they have to Finnish language and culture. So this video is about how most people come into contact with the Kalevala, which is in translation. And what we're going to do here today is go through a short potted history of Kalevala in translation, and then look at some very specific examples from three different translations of the same poem. Number 43, The Battle of the Sambo. This video draws a lot and primarily on the excellent Kalevala Maailmalla web resources by the Kalevala Society. And there'll be more information about that and some other key sources later on and in the description of the video as well. So the first question is, what is the Kalevala? The Kalevala is a collection of 50 poems compiled, edited, partly written by the physician and philologist Elias Nernroth, based on his field trips in Karelian regions, in particular in the early 19th century, where he collected folk poems, specifically with the intention of, um, of creating an epic for the Finnish people and elevating Finns to nationhood through poetry. The uh, Kalevala um, has a little bit of an in introduction to it first, but the stories range from the primordial creation of the world to the allegorical arrival of Christianity in Finland. The collection was published in 1849, and its first translation by Anton Schiefner was into German in 1851. But that was not the first Kalevala. What is now considered the old Kalevala was published in 1835. It had 32 poems. Um, the poems that it shared with the new Kalevala were in slightly different form and order. Conventions of the Finnish language had changed in, in between times. It's not what we consider the Kalevala these days, but for about 15 years it was. And that was first translated into Swedish in 1841 by M.A. Gastren. Now, that was the first published translation. There was a unpublished and by all accounts quite rough translation by um, Karl Niklas Kekman a little bit earlier, and he used that in, in his lectures on Finnish language. Around about the same time, and even prior to the publication of the Kalevala itself, there were um, Swedish translations published in Finnish newspapers, um, and these have been translated by Lundrud himself, as well as, as some of the um, literary greats, so Johann Wilhelm Snellmann and Johann Ludwig Runeberg. What's important to um, recognize is that at this point in time, even the most enthusiastic supporters of, of the Finnish language, who really wanted to help develop Finnish as a literary language, may not themselves have spoken Finnish fluently. So these early Swedish translations were important, not just in getting the Kalevala better known outside of Finland, but within Finland as well. Now, there may be the assumption that the, um, that the Kalevala was translated directly from Finnish. So translator reads the Finnish Kalevala, makes certain choices and arrives at an equivalent Kalevala in their target language. However, Particularly early on, um, Finnish was a fairly niche language. So there really wasn't the pool of people who would have been able to translate from Finnish directly into a range of other languages. So many of those early translations of the Kalevala in particular are themselves based on other translations. So, for example, the first English translation of the Kalevala in 1888 by John Martin Crawford was in fact a translation of Schiefner's German. Kalevala, and that was influenced by Kastren's Swedish translations. And in fact, Kastren and, and Schiefner corresponded a fair bit as well. The 1907 um, William Kirby translation, um, so this is the first English translation that was made directly from Finnish, has itself been the basis of many other abridged versions and other 
translations. So there is this sort of genealogy and, and interdependence of different translations. The Kirby one is actually one that we'll look at in a little bit more detail shortly. The Kalevala Maimala website has a updated list of translations of, of the Kalevala into different languages, and there's a, a timeline there as well. What's quite interesting is seeing the points in history where there is a uptick in interest in, in the Kalevala and more translations. And you can see that that happens in the early 40s, which is presumably to do with international interest and support of, of Finland's war against the attempted occupation of Finland by the Soviet Union. Something that's also quite interesting is that the, uh, the translation of the Kalevala may have nothing to do with Finland and Finnishness. There's a particular writer who, uh, who notes the, um, the translations of the Kalevala into Balkan languages following the breakup of Yugoslavia and, and argues that the Kalevala has a certain attraction um, as, as, a, as literature that has emerged and, and serves as, as this connection point of, of literature, tradition, language, history um, that had formed sort of in the shadow of, of more powerful neighbors. So, so the theory there effectively is that there is an interest in the nation building aspect of, of the Kalevala and what it meant and represented to, to Finns at, at the time of its initial publication, but then subsequently as, as well. In recent years, the Kalevala translations have kind of come full circle in that there have been translations into Karelian languages. So um, Zinaida Zubinina translated into Levi Karelian a few years ago and Raisa Remsheva into Vienna or North Karelian. Um, and so these are the the um, areas and um, language areas where uh, Londra did some of that early collecting. So there's a kind of homecoming in, in that respect with, with these Kalevala translations. So this is where we get to get um, uh, weirdly specific and look at Kalevala in a little bit more detail. So in this section, I'm going to look at um, poem 43, so the Battle of the Sampo, in, in a bit more detail in three different translations of the Kalevala. So we have the Kirby, 1907, we have Magoon, 1963, and we have Bosley, 1989. William Forsell Kirby was an entomologist with a wide knowledge of the world's languages and myths, and his Kalevala, Land of Heroes, translation was published in 1907. This is the version that J.R.R. Tolkien first read when he got interested in the Kalevala. Kirby's translation is in the original meter, although he does note that it's a difficult one to use in English. A few decades later, Francis Peabody Magoon, who was an English professor, produced a prose translation, and his intention there was to bring the repetition and the metaphor and the humour of the Kalevala more apparent. Keith Bosley was a poet and broadcaster, and he had a different approach entirely in that he developed a new line structure centered around five, seven or nine syllables. So although it's not Kalevalaic and it's not a prose translation, it has its own internal structural logic. And his reasoning there was that the original meter wasn't really suited to English and ended up sounding monotonous. So we'll have a look at a couple of little details in poem 43, The Battle of the Sampo. And what I'll do here is I'll read a few lines in Finnish, and then we'll just pick out a couple of details from three different translations. So in this first bit, the heroes of the Kalevala, Väinämöinen, Lemminkäinen, Ilmarinen, have stolen the Sampo, which is a magic contraption that guarantees wealth and prosperity from Lohi who is the main antagonist of the Kalevala, and she sets out to get back what's hers. Louhi Pohjolan emäntä kutsui Pohjolan kokohon, pani joukon jousihinsa, laittoi miehet miekkoihinsa, rakenteli pohjan purren, suoritti sotavenosen, latoi miehet laivahansa, suoritti sotaurohot, kuni sotka poikasensa, tavi lapsensa latovi, sata miestä miekallista, tuhat jousella urosta. So the first point of difference I want to look at here is what the different translators call Lohi, the main antagonist. They all have her as the mistress of a place, and Kirby here uses the original Pohjola, while Magoon decides to translate it as North Farm, which for me at least reduces the scale of Lohi's dominion somewhat, and overall Magoon tends to refer to places almost as administrative entities. So for example, he translates the, the place Kalevala as Kaleva district. 
Now, Bosley chooses to translate Bohila in a way that I consider to be most accurate or what I'm more drawn to, um, which is that it's not as all-encompassing as the North, but not as limited as farm. There's some minor variation here with regards to the animal names and your mileage may vary depending on how familiar you are with Nordic waterfowl. The archers and swordsmen come up in the next section as well, so we'll skip ahead there. In this bit, Bohila's warship crashes and lo, he has to salvage her forces and continue the pursuits in another way. Jopa muiksi muutalti he, tohti toisiksi ruveta. Otti viisi viikatetta, kuusi kuokan kuolioa. Nepä kynsiksi kyhäsi, kohenteli kouriksensa. Puolen purtta särkynyt, senpä allensa asetti. Laajat siiviksi sivalti, peräpuikon purstoksensa. Sata miestä siiven alle, tuhat purston tutkaimehen. Sata miestä miekallista. Tuhat ampuja urosta. Lävitäikse lentämä hän kokkona kohotteleikse. Lentiä lekuttelevi, tavoitelle väinämöistä. Siipi pilviä sipaisi, toinen vettä viiprahteli. So here we have a little bit of that repetition of number, the hundreds and thousands, which is quite characteristic of the Kalevala. There's an interesting difference here between the original and how the three different translators describe or name the archers. And the challenge here really is with the word uros, which is used as a synonym for man, but really has a connotation of a heightened sort of masculinity that I certainly find a little bit at odds with the Bosley's fellows in particular. And this section has one of the particularly interesting differences where the tone of the event changes a fair bit. So Lohi has transformed herself into a monstrous eagle and as such she poised herself and hovered, flies swiftly and flaps along. Now flaps along sounds quite ridiculous in comparison to the others, but when you look at the original, Lentea Lekuttelevi, it actually is a reasonably good match. Lekuttelevi has a lazy, unhurried sense and hovering works really well. Flies swiftly is very different, although arguably what Lohi should be doing. In this final section, the Sampo is destroyed in the battle and Lohi retreats in defeat. Siitä pohjalla nemäntä, sanan virkkoi noin nimesi. Jo minulta valta vaipui, jo aleni arvioni. Eloni meni merehen, Sampo särkyi lainhisin. Läks itkien kotihin, polotellen pohjoiseen. Ei saanut sanottavata koko sammusta kotihin. Veipä kuitenkin vähäisen, sormella nimettömällä. Kantoi kannen pohjalahan, sai rivan sarjolahan. Siitä on polo pohjalassa, elo leivätöi Lapissa. In this final part, I thought I'd just point out the alliteration that is really characteristic of the Kalevala, but quite hard to capture in English. So if we look at the original, we have a lot of it. Noin nimesi, valta vaipui, elo nimeni merehen, polotelen pohjoisehen, elo leivätöi Lapissa. You don't get as much of it in the translations, and it's not a focus for any of them. Maybe a little bit more in the Kirby, with the vowel sounds in particular. By the lake my wealth was taken, of the Samba brought she homeward. But the alliteration in particular is one feature that all of these translators have had to compromise on to one extent or another. So there we go. We've got that potted history of Kalevala in translation and maybe you've got a bit of a sense now as to what your preferred type of translation of the Kalevala might be. As I mentioned earlier there is the Kalevala Maailmala website which is which is excellent has a lot of these um, these sources there I'll have a full bibliography in the description as well. Thank you very much. Oli niin lähellä. Okei, leikataan, jatketaan. Okei.